Welcome everyone to the Norman Dorson Lecture of 2020. Before we get started, I just wanted to point out that um, Lynn is happy to answer questions at the end. And if you think of something while we're all talking and listening here, just use the chat function to the right of all these people up here. Where, which gives you a little box to type a question in, and Lynn will pick out the you know four or five at the end to answer. Okay, well we're honored to welcome Lynn Schur as the Norman Dorson lecturer. Lynn has had a quintessential news career. She's worked for everything from local television news in New York, for ABC as a network correspondent covering political conventions and reporting for 2020. Throughout her career, Lynn has covered a wide range of stories, specializing in women's issues and social change, as well as investigative reports. Her numerous awards include an Emmy, two American Women in Radio and Television Commendation Awards, a Gracie Award, and among other honors, a George Foster Peabody Award. She covered NASA and wrote books about women in the space program. An authority on women's history, Lynn wrote the biography, Failure is Impossible, Susan B. Anthony in her own words. She co-authored Susan B. Anthony's Slept Year, A Guide to American Women's Landmarks, and 10 editions of the Women's Calendar. She served as a consultant and an on-camera expert for Ken Burns's suffrage documentary, Not For Ourselves Alone. Most recently, she is the co-host of the new podcast, She Votes, celebrating the centennial of women's suffrage. Lynn? Thank you, Lisa, and hi to everybody. Thank you so much for being here today. Hi. I can see you waving. That's nice. Those of you who do have your video on, no need, no need. Um, and I, we have lots to talk about today. I do want your questions, and I hope there'll be lots of questions, um, talking about suffrage, talking about our foremothers who persisted to get us the right to vote. Uh, but I want to start, and just bear with me a little bit, because um, we're going to do try a little technology here. Uh, I'm going to show you the uh, first, it's a little two-minute uh, video trailer for our podcast, and it'll give you a pretty good idea of what we do in the podcast, which you can, it's all out there now, we're done, um, there are eight episodes, you can binge the whole thing, it is free, um, but this will give you a sense of what it is and a little bit of what I'm going to talk about today. So bear with me, and I'm going to get this video going, if I can make it happen. Share computer screen. Shout, shout, up with your song. Cry with the wind, for the dawn is breaking. A hundred years ago, the 19th Amendment was ratified. But the fight for the right to vote began long before then and continues even today. If you understand the women's suffrage movement in all of its complexity, you understand this country. Voter suppression is not new. The point is to keep white men in power. I'm Lynn Schur. And I'm Ellen Goodman. And this is She Votes, a new podcast from Wonder Media Network. We spent our careers telling stories of stunning social change and crushing backlash. Lynn, you won a Peabody Award for your TV journalism. And you got the Pulitzer for your columns, Ellen, the best in the business. And now we're casting light on the stories of suffrage, an extraordinary accomplishment, sadly unfinished. I think we have a tendency to look back on the suffrage struggle as moving towards 
an inevitable success. It was never a done deal. Each week, we'll tell a new story from the battle for the ballot. And some of the men said, oh, you're not really a woman. And she said, well, yeah. And then she showed her breast to show that she was a woman. The younger generation emerges and says, we're tired of waiting. We're sick of asking and pleading and being polite. We're willing to be disruptive. This is a huge transformation to culture. If this sounds familiar, it should be. They are facing many of the decisions that our nation is facing today. Our heroes are not perfect. We just have to tell the truth about what it is. Subscribe now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Okay, so have I stopped sharing? Yes. Okay, there we go. Thank you. So that's that's essentially what the podcast is about and what I want to talk to you about today. So let me start by saying to everyone, happy anniversary. Happy anniversary of this extraordinary centennial that we are now celebrating. Uh, this is a very momentous year to be celebrating the ratification of the 19th Amendment. A major, oh, sorry, are we okay? Yep. Thought I heard something, sorry. It's a major first step uh, in guaranteeing all American women the right to vote. Of course, this version of celebration today is not how we thought we would be celebrating. Uh, if you had asked me one year ago or six months ago or two years ago, I would have said, oh yeah, big celebrations, firecrackers, a uh, big sheet cake, white pantsuits, um, but of course, uh, that's not the way we celebrate these days. And we can all adapt. So this is how we are celebrating, and it's never too late to be toasting the 19th Amendment to the Constitution with all of its flaws and its shortcomings, and to toast the women and the men who made it possible and who made it happen. Let me start by saying exactly what we are celebrating. On August 26, 1920, 100 years ago, the 19th Amendment to the Constitution was adopted into the Constitution. On that day, the voting population of the United States doubled, just doubled, just like that. Never before in history have we seen anything like that. It was the largest single expansion of voters in American history. More importantly, as historian Ann Gordon from Rutgers tells us in our podcast, it was a reversal of the centuries old assumption that men and only men were genetically designed to rule, to govern and to lead. In other words, it was a power shift and the beginning of a big mind shift, giant tectonic plates changing around this country. Of course, that was the law that was written into the constitution. It is not what happened on the ground. Uh, in this country, it was states, individual states, who always controlled voting rules. And it was state constitutions that always kept women and people of color and people with no wealth um, from voting. So it was states that created all the barriers to registrations and to voting. And now the federal government was stepping in, but maybe not quite the way it should have. Here is exactly how the amendment reads, the 19th Amendment to the Constitution. And I quote, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Notice it's kind of negative, shall not be denied. But of course they did. Millions of African-American women in the South, unlike their newly enfranchised black sisters in the North and in Northern cities, millions of Southern African-American women were kept from the polls by brutal Jim Crow laws. Native Americans and women of Chinese and Mexican origin waited even more years for their rights. Still, this amendment that we celebrate now was a very, very important first step. It took more than seven decades to get there, and it took three generations of American women and men. That is what and whom we also celebrate. They persisted. 
And let's get the language straight. Women were not given or granted the right to vote. Women won the right to vote. After campaigning and fighting and organizing and lobbying, and that's why we call it the battle for the ballot. These women and men persisted, and this is the reason that we salute them today. They are our heroes, imperfect heroes in many cases, but aren't we all? So that's the story we set out to tell in our podcast, She Votes, what we won, what we didn't win, and how the opposition to women's suffrage and to voting for all people continues today in the widespread voter suppression that keeps so many citizens from exercising their rights. I can't tell you all the details of this story in our short time together, but um, I really want to offer up some of my favorite highlights. And I want to bounce a bit between the historic and the present because everything that happened then, everything that happened in the run up to our getting the right to vote in this country is very much related to what's happening right now. Uh, and I'm going to illustrate what I'm saying uh, with some images. Uh, let, me, let me gather some of them together and hope that we can pull this off. Okay, let me share the screen. Share, okay, here we go. So this was the celebration in August of 1920. There's a newspaper headline and I've circled in the upper left if you can see it three cents. That's how much a paper cost. That was the difference in the world. Uh, a difference also because there were a lot of newspapers. But U.S. women get vote. That is what I'd call a full lead banner headline. I can listen to it. <laughs> Here's yeah. another one from the Lowell Mass Sun. Suffrage wins. This is when Tennessee became the 36th state to ratify. We'll get there in a minute. Big banner headlines. Um, this is what uh, people celebrated in 1920. This is how big a story it was. I love this one. Woman suffrage fight finished. Here's why I love this one. The fight was not finished. We had a long way to go. Uh, but in Seattle, Washington on August 26, 1920, they decided it was finished. Not quite, but it was a good start. Now here's that same headline and I've circled over here women to vote in all states next November. This is important because before 1920, quite a number of states already individually had allowed women to vote either partial voting or complete voting up to presidential elections. So that headline's important to remember how the history went. And then over here on the right, Colby puts amendment into effect. Um, Colby was the secretary of state and he's the one that, that signed it into being. And um, again, just to show you the importance, women's right to ballot now part of Constitution. This is how important it was. It was part of the Constitution. And the final headline I show you, uh, for a reason, women win right to vote in suffragette victory, 19th Amendment ratified. While I, while I take us down from this for a minute, let me explain to you, um, I have a little thing about, whoops, uh, stop sharing. I have a thing about that word suffragette, um, and, and I'm going to educate you all very quickly right now. The women, most of the women who fought for our right to vote did not want to be called suffragettes. That was a diminutive. That was a kind of a put down. And it was a term that got started by some newspaper guys in England. They were a little ahead of us over there when the women there were called suffragettes. Uh, you know, like laundrette, or uh, it's like a mini-me. It's like a little version of the real thing. They wanted to be called suffragists in this country. Over there, the British women said, well, we kind of, we're going to co-op that term. So you can call us suffragettes, and we'll call ourselves suffragettes. And, and then they, they had some very, um, shall we say, bold street tactics, and they liked being called it. In this country, the women mostly preferred being called suffragists. So... There, there was a tiny little group at the end that wanted to be suffragettes, but mostly were suffragists. So, so you saw the headlines. We're celebrating the right to vote, August of 1920. So, how did we get there? Um, it was not inevitable. It was not just bound to happen. It really did take three generations and more than 72 years. 
And the extraordinary thing is that today, here we are talking about it, and you pick up your papers, you go online, you watch television, you've probably seen a dozen more references to this, but I bet you when most of you were growing up, you didn't know too much about it. I have a vague recollection of my junior high school um, social studies book that had a cartoon of some lady and it said, and then a bunch of crazy ladies and bloomers ran around to get the right to vote. That's about it. That's what we learned. Um, needless to say, they were not a bunch of crazy ladies. Uh, these were very wise women and men who understood understood the very radical notion that women were actually people, which they were not considered so at the time, certainly not legal people. The American woman suffrage movement really is rooted in the abolition movements of the early 1800s. Many of the same women who opposed slavery, who, who fought and lobbied to abolish slavery were the same ones who went on to become suffragists. Um, what's so interesting is that the fact that are, uh, the roots of, this, of the suffrage movement are in the abolition movement is because women looked at, at what they were seeing with, with enslaved people and said, wait a minute, that's a kind of oppression that may be more brutal than what we've got, but we understand oppression now. And maybe it applies to us in some way as well. And there was a second piece of it. The early um, abolitionist women at first were not permitted to speak by the male abolitionists in their meetings. So the female abolitionists went off and started their own societies. And in 1837, there was a female abolitionist meeting. Uh, it was interracial. It was groundbreaking in many ways. And for the first time publicly, a group of women uh, demanded the right to be part of the public discourse, the public dialogue. It was about one thing only, it was about slavery, but it was a beginning. And it's really where the roots of this whole thing uh, are. And what's so interesting is that, uh, for those of you with um, long enough memories, the second wave of the modern women's movement in the 70s also grew out of the civil rights movement. It's almost the exact same thing, it's fascinating. So there's a real, a real parallel here, and what happened then is, is so much what is happening, what's happened in my life and what is happening today. In any event, um, uh, the, the, the women who were abolitionists uh, said, wait a minute, we need our rights too. And one of those women was a, a young girl named Elizabeth Cady, uh, who as a child, her father was a lawyer. She lived in upstate New York. And one of Elizabeth Cady's kind of aha moments was her dad was a lawyer, as I say, and people, women would come to her dad and say, terrible things are happening to, how do I get out of this legally? How do you get me my rights? And little Elizabeth um, went into her dad's law books and she saw the laws against women and she took his scissors and she cut them out. She cut out the laws thinking this will get rid of them. Well, it was an adorable thing for a child to do. The good news is uh, that much later she found a way to do that in a much more significant way. Um, and of course, I'm now talking about the uh, first women's rights convention in Seneca Falls in 1848, which was organized by Elizabeth Cady Stanton and uh, another remarkable woman, Lucretia Mott, a Quaker woman from Pennsylvania. Both uh, um, Lucretia Mott was one of the organizers of that 1837 abolitionists uh, meeting. So these are women with, with great roots. As those of you who may have listened to the podcast already know, um, before the virus hit, Ellen Goodman, my co-host and I, got up to Seneca Falls, New York, and we went to this Women's Rights National Historical Park uh, with a group of high school kids to get their reactions to what happened there, which was very exciting to see. Uh, how a few hundred women and men gathered, and for the first time at least, some of them agreed to demand the right to vote. And bear with me. Uh, we're going to see some pictures here. Share screen, share. Here we go. This is um, the signpost up at Seneca Falls, New York. First convention for women's rights was held on this corner in 1848. I should point out this is now a park, a National Historic Park. You can go visit that building on the left that you see. That red brick building is a reconstructed Wesleyan Chapel 
where the meeting was held. Um, thank goodness this place now exists in some form. When I first started doing my research on women's rights and the suffrage movement about 40 years ago, uh, there was no memorial, there was no commemoration. In fact, the site of the first women's rights convention in America was a laundromat, which I think tells you something about the priorities for women in any of them. Inside, what's so charming about this wonderful memorial, uh, there's a, there are these not quite life-size statues of the crowd that was there. Uh, they're bronze statues. And so here's Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and here's Frederick Douglass, who was one of the early uh, and very stalwart supporters of women's rights. And um, I think this might be, uh, no, this is another local woman. It's not Lucretia Mott, too bad. Uh, in any event, you, when, I, I advise you to go see it. It's a wonderful, um, it's a wonderful memorial. It's a wonderful thing to see, and it'll give you a real sense of um, what was going on in this country at the time. So, 1848, or a little bit before then, was a time when the 26 United States of America were ruled by Blackstone's English common law. And that's the one that bluntly stated, the husband and the wife are one, and that one is the husband. What it meant is a married woman virtually had no rights. She could not own property, she could not make contracts, she could not sue or be sued, and she could not be, garden, be a guardian of her own children. Uh, there were no colleges for women. There were few professions beyond housework, sewing, teaching, and factories. And there was nothing approaching equal pay or equal political rights. And of course, no woman could vote, not for mayor, not for school board, and certainly not for president of the United States. America was changing, however, and many women were moving towards a much more public life. And at that convention in Seneca Falls, for the very first time, they adopted a resolution demanding that women have the right to vote. This was very, very radical, I should tell you. So who were these people that did all this wonderful stuff? Well, as I say, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Lucretia Mott, Frederick Douglass were at that first meeting. Uh, let me show you a few more people, uh, Cher, who were there. Sojourner Truth. Sojourner Truth was uh, for a long period of her life an enslaved woman in New York State, I might add. Slavery was not just in the South. Um, she was a very active suffragist and went out there and uh, she was a big, uh, a great orator and she went and spoke around the country, uh, around the area, uh, and she wound up in Battle Creek, Michigan. That's Sojourner. Uh, there were a number, many African American women who obviously free women in the North, um, who were very active in the suffrage movement. And the leaders were unquestionably, however, over here, um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and over here, Susan B. Anthony, not quite represented to scale. Elizabeth was kind of a little short, dumpy person, and Susan was taller. This scene is in, um, this is a statue in um, Seneca Falls, and this is Amelia Bloomer um, wearing her, the famous Bloomer costume, to which she gave the name, which were caused women so much ridicule, they stopped wearing them pretty quickly. But Amelia Bloomer introduced Susan and Elizabeth in 1851. And that was a very, very important moment because these two women became the guiding lights, the philosophers and the organizers of the suffrage movement for the next, um, uh, let's see, until about more than half a century. This was their lives. Here's another picture, this is Susan. This is Elizabeth, more, much more what they really looked like. Um, and they were an extraordinary partnership, just amazing. And here's one of my favorite scenes. This is in Rochester, right outside of the house and museum where Susan B. Anthony lived. This is Susan, and this is her good friend, Frederick Douglass. And this is called um, Having Tea. And I love their positions. I love that she's being very forceful with him and, and he's listening and that's the way their lives were. And what they also represent is that 
things didn't always go smoothly in the suffrage movement. There were falling outs, there were problems, there were fights, there was racism, there was classism, and yet the leaders got back together to make this thing happen. Um, this friendship, which was occasionally a very fraught friendship, nonetheless um, is one that I think symbolizes uh, quite a lot um, for this, this movement that we're talking about. Now, if I can find you again, uh, stop share, here we go. So it was going to, after Seneca Falls, you now know who some of the players are, after Seneca Falls um, was 72 years, 72, before women got the right to vote. Other things happened in between there. We had the 15th Amendment, which gave African-American men the right to vote. Uh, there was even the income tax amendment that happened before the women's suffrage amendment. So this country had other priorities, um, but we finally got there. And one of the ways we got there was because these women were just so gutsy and because they just, they just didn't stop. And I must say one of my favorite stories, um, I, I'm very partial to Susan B. Anthony, so forgive me if you hear more about her than about other people. There were many other women who were terrific. Um, my heart goes out to Susan. But, um, in 1872, um, Susan was 52 years old. She decided it was time to just, um, enough of this begging, organizing, cajoling. Uh, she was just gonna go vote. Uh, the 14th Amendment had been passed, making freed slaves citizens. And one of their lawyer friends said, well, wait a minute, Susan. Um, if a freed slave is a citizen and a citizen has the right to vote, uh, and you're born in America, you're a citizen, you already have the right to vote. Susan encouraged lots of women all across the country to vote, a number of them did. She gathered 14 of her, sister, her friends, including a couple of sisters in Rochester. And in November of 1872, Susan B. Anthony went to the polls and voted. She voted for Ulysses S. Grant for president. Uh, those were the days when the Republicans were the very progressive party. Uh, she voted for a couple of other down-ballot Republicans, essentially browbeat the registrars into letting her register, and then a week later they went back and voted. This was a really big deal. It was headlines all over the country, in part because Susan, who was very, very savvy about the press, stopped in at the newspaper office after she had voted and said, here's what I've just done. Here's why it's important. I've already got a lawyer. Uh, we think this is a big deal. It's essentially a test case, so we can all get the right to vote now. So Susan votes. There are many newspaper headlines. There's pro and there's con. The federal government was not happy. The federal government did not want women to have the right to vote. There was a power shift taking place. They didn't want this to be part of it. So all the women get arrested. Um, they all get arraigned. Only Susan B. Anthony was sent to trial and was convicted. Susan B. Anthony, until a couple of weeks ago, I'll get there in a minute, was a convicted felon for the crime of voting while female. When she was tried, incidentally, she was not permitted to testify in her defense. The jury was all white men. Uh, there were no women who could speak at the trial. So pretty gutsy to go and do this and to go through the trial. And in our podcast, we have the great Christine Baranski reading the words of Susan B. Anthony at one of the most fabulous uh, trial speeches you've ever heard. Susan did it completely off the cuff. It is a moment of civil rights and individual liberties that you must hear to believe. It's just great. In any event, um, she gets arrested, she gets tried, she gets convicted. She's now a convicted felon. And the judge finds her $100. And Susan says, uh, I will never pay a dollar of your unjust fine. And he says, well, if you're, well, I'm not going to make you go to jail before you pay your fine. So he never, fi he never gets the money. He never puts her in jail. But by doing all this, she loses her chance to take her case up higher and remained until a few weeks ago a convicted felon. As you may have heard, um, somebody in the White House decided to pardon her. Um, it's kind of a joke. Uh, Susan B. Anthony did not want to be pardoned to the understanding of history, yet another example of no understanding of history. She had no desire to be pardoned. You know why? 
if you get pardoned, you're admitting your guilt and you're being pardoned from something that you are guilty of. She never thought she was guilty. Uh, she knew perfectly well that what she had done was legitimate and that the government had just come down on her like a ton of bricks. So um, she didn't want to be pardoned. She would have liked to have gotten rid of the fine, which she never paid. Uh, my, my partner, my podcasting partner, Ellen Dubner, thinks that it's now worth about $2,000. Ellen thinks we should take the money, that the money ought to be given to women running for office as a kind of a, a thank you from Susan. Um, in any event, just to give you a sense of what, um, of, of how Susan was treated in those days after she voted and after she was um, found guilty, Here's the pic, here's the image on the daily graphic of Susan. Oops. Here she is. Here's Susan looking like, I don't know what she's looking like, but it's the world turned upside down. If you look in the background, if you can see, let's see if I can scroll in a little bit here. There's a man holding a baby. This is what they were afraid of. It would be the world turned upside down. Men would have to take care of babies. Here's a woman as a police officer. Imagine how horrible that would be. Um, here's a bunch of women demanding their rights. And here's Susan B. Anthony, who was a, a very wonderful woman, looking like, always with her umbrella, uh, looking in their terms, unwomanly. That was a favorite word of of the anti-suffrage crowd is that you were unwomanly if you if you sought the right to vote. So this is how they saw Susan. Um, this is the way the press treated her. This is the way she was seen for trying to vote. So in any event, she um, went through that. Um, never and and she was um, found guilty in 1873, and it would take almost another half century before we got the right to vote with the 19th Amendment. So what else were these women up against? Um, interestingly, it wasn't just the men in government, essentially the white men in government, but most women in this country either didn't care about or were opposed to the right to vote for themselves in the early days. And they really opposed it with passion. Uh, you think our opinions are split today? Go back a century or so, there were 25 anti-suffrage state societies. Uh, there were 350,000 women who fought against the right to vote in the 19th century. Just to give you an example, we had the Massachusetts Association opposed to the further extension of suffrage and the Iowa Association. And there was one in California, Illinois, Oregon, uh, so on and so on. They had their own books, they had their own brochures, they had flowers, they had songs. I'll show you some in a minute. Uh, so who were these women and why did they oppose their own rights? Uh, they were mostly white. There were really not, um, nobody, no historian we've talked to has come up with any African-American anti-suffragist women. Uh, but the white women were mostly middle class, upper middle class women, predominantly white. Um, they, they liked their privilege is what it was. Uh, and they mostly liked the fact that they were on that pedestal and that their husbands took care of them. Um, and they were scared. They were scared of responsibilities beyond what they had been taught since they were children, that they were mostly, you know, in the house and taking care of, of house things. So, um, it's kind of sad. Uh, but that's who they were. And just to give you an example, let me show you some of the other, some of the wonderful, um, maybe not so wonderful, uh, anti-suffrage, hold on a second. These are some of the artifacts of um, what was going on in the anti-suffrage world. Okay, this was a little ticket from the New Jersey Association vote no on women's suffrage October 19th. And you'll see if we flip it, the net result of women's suffrage wherever tried has been a loss to the state and a loss to women. Clearly not true. Then we have a little brochure why the farmer should oppose women's suffrage. Now we have this wonderful sheet music, no suffragettes for mine. 
Um, here, once again, the world turned upside down. If women get the right to vote, men are going to have to do the laundry. Imagine that. Uh, Boston, stick to the women, vote no on women suffrage. Here's the other side, giving you an address and all that. And this is my favorite. This is a little card, and that's a little fuzzy, fuzzy wool with two buttons. Somebody actually made this. Oh, you suffragette. You know it's not the vote you want, but something else that itches. Not satisfied with your own pants. You want to wear our britches. That's what they were afraid of. Women wearing the pants. Can you imagine? I do want to point out that for all of this, the women who were suffragists really knew what they were doing. For example, here's a little tiny brochure they put out. This little book contains every reason why women should not vote. Ready? Ready? There you go. There are no reasons. No reason at all why women should not vote. Oy, it's exhausting. I know. Thank you. It is exhausting to deal with them. So the women, the suffragists just kept going. They were great. Three generations, they lobbied, they campaigned, they organized. Um, and just to give you an understanding of the kinds of things that were going on. So here's a 1905, Susan P. Anthony. So a New York State Women's Suffrage Association, 37th Annual Convention, 37th Annual Convention. Rochester, 1905. Susan B. Anthony is 85 years old at this point, and she just keeps going. And it was not, I should point out, without ridic more ridicule. This woman, who was very definitely could be stubborn and could be a bit bossy, was nonetheless fit and healthy and always listened. And here's how she was portrayed in cartoons. This, by the way, is former President Grover Cleveland, who had given a really stupid, kind of dopey interview to the Ladies' Home Journal in which he said that women should be at home and never leave the home, and here's Susan racing after him and Uncle Sam laughing in the background. Hard to know whether Uncle Sam is laughing at her or him, but nonetheless, that's the way, that's the way Susan was portrayed in those days. This is what... This is what these women were up against um, for all this period of time that they, that they were trying to win the right to vote. Finally, finally, uh, around the beginning of the 20th century, the tide began, began to turn. A new generation came in, and I'm skipping over huge things here just to give you the bare bones. Uh, Alice Paul was one of the young, mil more militant leaders who had been in England and seen what they were doing over there, came back here and had some tactics she wanted to use. Uh, one of the tactics was marches. So they had a bunch of, they started having suffrage parades. And one of the first was in New York City, and I think it was 1905. And if I'm not mistaken, there were six, six, six women, and it got huge press coverage because six women marched up, for, up Fifth Avenue uh, from Union Square up to 23rd Street, and this was a, a really big deal. Um, but the really big deal march that, that came next was the one in Washington, D.C. Uh, in 1913. And this was, um, this was organized by Alice Paul and by the, traditional, the more traditional woman suffrage organization. And there were 5,000 women and they marched uh, down Pennsylvania Avenue. And here's, here was the cool thing. They did this on the eve, the eve of Woodrow Wilson's inauguration. Woodrow Wilson was opposed to woman suffrage. So these women, they or, uh, organized this march, which guaranteed they would get lots and lots of press coverage. And Alice Paul was no dummy. She understood that one thing the almost all male press would like was beauty. So here's a woman named Inez Milholland, an absolutely stunning lawyer who lived in Greenwich Village on her white horse. And, and of course, the men just loved it. And they gave this lots and lots of coverage. Oh, not there yet. I'll come back there. The other thing that happened during this march is that while the women were marching, a bunch of drunken men attacked them attacked them, made fun of them, and suddenly the press got very sympathetic, and the tide began to turn. It was 
The press was going along with it. Uh, uh, the press, excuse me, was going along with the right to vote. Suddenly they understood there were big changes in the world. More women were working outside the home. And then Alice Paul did something even better for the movement. She organized the first ever pickets in front of the White House. There had never before been anybody picketing the White House. So they were called silent sentinels. They stood there and here's one of the banners, Mr. President Woodrow Wilson, how long must women wait for liberty? And what they did on some of the other banners, which you can't see here, is they just quoted Wilson's words about freedom in Europe back to him about freedom for women in this country. So the, the tide is, is beginning to turn. Here's an example of the tide beginning to turn, coming in with the tide. Now here's somebody, here's woman suffrage coming in with the tide, and here's an anti trying to sweep it out. Clearly not possible. More of the tide turning. There are songs for woman suffrage. How are you going to keep male politics? Votes for women. It is coming. She's good enough to be your baby's mother, and she's good enough to vote with you. God, don't you love this? And here's another way that we knew the tide was turning. The Saturday Evening Post came out for votes for women. That's a really big deal. Clearly, it was time. It was time for woman suffrage. And people knew it. People understood it. So what happens next, now we're going to skip ahead to 19, uh, after the parade in Washington, which really was a turning point, uh, suddenly the they start having meetings in Congress, and the committees are meeting, and they are uh, finally determining. Um, okay, we'll get this. We'll get this amendment finally, and the amendment is finally passed in the House and in the Senate, and it goes out for ratification. And in order to be ratified, the Nineteenth Amendment, uh, which, by the way, when it was first proposed in 1878, was the Sixteenth Amendment. Well, here we are. Now we're in the 19 teens and it's the 19th Amendment, and they need 36 states. And they get a bunch of states quickly, and then it takes a while, takes a while, takes a while. Finally, they're down to one more state. They need one more state. That state is Tennessee. Not exactly the state you would have chosen if you were a suffrage leader in those days. This is a very conservative place. At least it was half conservative. Um, and it was a place also riven by, by racism and a lot of stuff going on there. The good news is that there was a young legislator by the name of Harry T. Byrne. Um, he was 25 years old. And Harry T. Byrne listened on the day of the vote in the Tennessee State Legislature in Nashville, listened to his mother. Harry's mom, Feb, F-E-B-B, Byrne, Feb Byrne, uh, believed in suffrage. And she knew that Harry was kind of wavering and she wasn't quite sure what to do about it. So she writes him a letter on the day before um, the vote and he gets it as he's walking, it's so dramatic, as he's walking into the Capitol and he reads this letter which has in it a grocery list, please do this, please do that. And in the middle it says, I know you're kind of wavering, and it says, hoorah and vote for suffrage. Don't forget to be a good boy. And sure enough, Harry T. Byrne votes for woman suffrage, and it passes by one vote in the Tennessee State Legislature. And here, it, whoop, getting ahead of myself, here is, is that up or not? Not yet. Oh dear, one second, share, 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 share screen. Yes, share. Here's the picture. Here, this is in Knoxville. There's Harry and there's mom. Mother knows best, right? And Harry always said that he voted for suffrage because his mother told him to and because mother knows best. So who offered? So on August 18th, Tennessee passes it, pandemonium reigns. The next day, the legislature tried to rescind it. They could not. It goes to Washington, and we now have suffrage. This is Alice Paul, the Quaker lady who 
uh, or organize those marches in Washington. She's sewing one more star, the final star, uh, onto the flag. And here at the National Women's Party, she lowers the flag and it was done. It was done. We had the right to vote. This is one of my favorite things. A woman named Nina Allender, a cartoonist. This is called Any Good Suffragist the Morning After. She is sleeping in after three generations and 72 years of hard work. And here is Uncle Sam welcoming women into the voting booth. Not quite, as I've mentioned. There was still a lot of work to do, but what a great start. And I will end this by saying, I actually have an image that to me sums it up in a way that nothing else ever has. Remember her? Little Lulu. No longer can Tubby write, no girls allowed. Now, he says, she says, girls are allowed. So that's my little brief history of the suffrage movement. Um, I would love to hear your questions. There's so much I couldn't say. Uh, and it's so pertinent for today in voter suppression. So let's take a look at, at some of your questions and see, um, have, Lisa, have you been monitoring these? I have not. You, you have to unmute yourself, let's see. Ah, why was it called, I'm just gonna go down the list here. Why was it called Women's Rights and Not Women's Rights? Reading the historic sign. It's funny, um, they always called it woman suffrage an artifact of the times. Uh, it's what I tend to do also. It's women's rights, it's women's rights, it's for one woman, it's for all of us. Uh, as long as the point is made, uh, it's fine, but I still call it women's suffrage. Uh, Mount Holyoke College was founded in 1837. So it was, so it was. And um, I said there were no colleges for women at the time of Seneca Falls, you're absolutely right. Uh, anybody know what the first uh, co-educational college was that let women in? Oberlin, wasn't it? Oh, Oberlin. Way to go, Lisa. You know your women's history. Okay, what do we got? Um, one of the first arguments against women having the right to vote was that women would always vote according to how their husbands voted. It would just double each household's vote. That's true. And the counter argument, and the other part of the argument was and if they don't vote the same way, it will cause dissension in the household. And we can't have dissension in the household. Um, and in fact, in the beginning, uh, there was not a lot of difference between men's votes and women's votes. We started to see the gender gap, which is the difference between how women vote and how men vote, uh, starting really in the, in, the 90, in the 80s and 90s. And now there's quite, we may very well have um, a, a gender gap that is historic in this presidential election. All the polls so far indicate that. It is, however, only September, so I make no predictions. But um, uh, the gender gap did not exist for a while, and they were afraid that it either would or wouldn't. Uh, let's see. Um, what do you see as the current most pressing challenge in voting? It is exactly the same thing as the Jim Crow laws in the South, at convicting Susan B. Anthony of voting while female. It's making up things that are not, uh, that don't pertain to keep people away. And one we interviewed for our last episode, uh, Stacey Abrams, the wonderful Stacey Abrams, whose wonderful um, organization is, is trying to get rid of voter suppression around the country. And she told a story that to me is so meaningful. She said her grandmother, uh, was born without the right to vote. By the way, my mother was born without the right to vote, as I'm sure a lot of you can say the same thing. My mother got the right to vote when she got to be 21, but when she was born in 1903, uh, women did not have the right to vote. Um, in any event, Stacey Abrams talks about the fact that her grandmother in the South did not have the right to vote, and finally, with the Voting Rights Act of 1965, uh, her grandmother did have the right to vote but she was terrified to go to the polls and would not go because she had seen what had happened, the brutality, the murders, um, all the awful things that happened to the rest of her family when they tried to vote before the Voting Rights Act existed. And it was the muscle memory and it was the fear. And she says, 
you don't need to have an actual law that says you can't vote. If you're scared of it, you won't go. And that's what we're fighting today. The biggest thing we're fighting today is people being afraid to go and then um, having all of these obstacles put in place that say they can't. This is the biggest problem we have today. Um, let's see. There are famous examples of Marian Anderson not being permitted to sing, Frederick Douglass not being allowed to speak. Did Susan B. have similar experiences? Uh, yeah, they were told not to speak in a number of places, and guess what? They just did it. Uh, there was a big celebration in Philadelphia on July 4th, 1876, 100 years of the um, uh, uh, Declaration. And the women were not invited to participate. And a group of them just went and walked up the steps and just started to speak. They were thrown out pretty quickly. But yeah, they had exactly the same thing. There, there's, there's been so, there's almost, you know, there's no difference. It, it, discrimination is discrimination. And, and it's wonderful to see um, what's, I think, what's going on in this country right now because it's a, it's a way of, of, of making us all th realize where we were discriminated against and how that feels for other people as well. And um, uh, yeah, they, all, they felt it and they got by it in their own way. I will also point out that Susan B. Anthony said at one point in her life, I firmly believe that someday a woman will be elected president of the United States. She said that in 1905. So we have a long way to go to catch up with Susan. More questions? Anybody pipe up if you'd like. Unmute yourself though. Yeah, unmute yourself and I think somewhere there. Okay. there you go. Hi. Hi, Lenny. It's Margaret. Margaret, how are you? <laughs> Good. Um, I'm delighted to hear this and see you. Um, I've just been reading um, Stamped from the beginning. I don't know if you've read that book. Uh, it's, an, it got, it's an incredible one, the National Book Award for nonfiction. And uh, it's probably one of the greatest, um, uh, what I say, uh, exegesis of, of uh, anti-racial thinking in the United States from the beginning. And we seem to be rather unusual in this, unlike other European countries, which as he points out, mostly persecuted people for religion <laughs> rather than color. But anyway, one of the things he said, which I thought was um, surprising to me was that at the conference, I think it was at Seneca Falls, but maybe not, Harriet Tubman went in and the uh, the white women didn't want her to come and they sort of told her not to come and, and oh, it's certainly uh, I don't know certainly not Seneca Falls right. um, the only record we have of any African American at Seneca Falls was Frederick Douglass there's no record of any African American women coming or trying to come in uh, Harriet Tubman lived in Auburn New York which is very near Rochester she and Susan were good friends Susan helped her uh, outfit slaves for the Underground Railroad. Um, I don't know that story. And I, um, Harriet Tubman was a suffragist and, and, and believed in it. So, I mean, what he's, it's the time where she gave the talk about Ain't I a Woman? Oh, and that's Sojourner Truth. Oh, Sojourner Truth. I'm so sorry. That's okay. Sojourner Truth um, uh, gave um, a talk in 1851, uh, I believe it was, uh, in Ohio. Uh, it's the talk we know of as the famous Ain't I a Woman speech. Um, Nell Painter, who's a wonderful uh, historian, has written a book, I recommend to you, a biography of Sojourner Truth. She kind of tears, she says that speech was a made up speech. There's a more accurate version, um, which doesn't use the word ain't, uh, which is a little bit less um, uh, uh, in the vernacular. Um, Sojourner Truth actually had a Dutch background and her accent would not have been Southern slang, it would have been Dutch New York. In any event, the point of the speech, which, um, and, and she was not denied access to that uh, convention. No, she wasn't denied, but they sort of... She was invited to speak and she spoke uh, by the women there. Um, the point of that wonderful speech in whatever words uh, were the accurate words is 
don't tell me that the only women are delicate, um, uh, frilly women staying home with their children. I'm out there in my farms, I'm plowing, and I'm a woman too. And, and this, this is a really important part of the suffrage movement that women had to prove you could, there's not just one kind of woman, there's many kinds of women. So it's a great example. It's a wonderful example of what they were fighting against. In that case, it was not racism with other women. In that case, it was proving to men that, that um, black women are women too. Lynn? Yeah? I'm, I'm gonna pipe up with a story that occurred here in Cornwall, Connecticut, population around 1500. But um, at the time when women could first vote, um, I was told by two extremely old ladies, and there's some people here who remember them, Bessie Blake and Harriet Clark, who were over a hundred at the time they told me this. We were in the town hall just waiting for something to happen. And they said, oh look, that's where we registered to vote. And I said, tell me more about it. Well, there was a great long table up against the long wall and sitting at the table were three or four of um, the leading gentlemen in the town of Cornwall and their purpose was to quiz the women who showed up to um, sign the register um, <laughs> about civics, the constitution, America. And, and that's, you know, barriers, so it's just classic barrier. So, That's exactly what Jim Crow did. They would make them recite whole sections of the Constitution, which, which no white person ever did. And in this case, no man ever had to do. Yeah. Um, and it's uh, I just, uh, just, uh, just making the, the rest of that point, going back to Margaret's question, part of the thing, it wasn't at that meeting, uh, but what we used in the trailer, that quote from Nell Painter about uh, Sojourner Truth at another meeting, they didn't believe she was a woman and they made her show her breast to prove she was a woman because she was too strong. She couldn't possibly be a woman. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, so much of this has to do with what your image of a person is and, and what you're supposed to be. And as I say, the most... The evilest thing they could say about one of the suffragists was unwomanly or unsexed. And this just went on and on. And, and unknowledgeable is part of the same thing, I think, Lisa. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and um, so we looked and looked everywhere, including the state library, for that register of that 1920 year when the women would have registered their names and we never found it. We found a later one, but not that one. It's a big shame. But well, there's, lot, there's lots of stories and the obstacles that were put in women's way. Another, another example of that same thing I'll give you is um, after we won the right to vote, um, uh, women, only one third of the eligible female voters voted in the 1920 presidential election. Now, that was the year that Warren G. Harding was elected, so nobody wants to take credit for that under any circumstances. But um, there was some, uh, twice as many men voted of the proportion of eligible men. So, so only a third of eligible women voted. And all of a sudden there were these articles in the paper and one article in the paper actually was headlined, is woman suffrage a failure? In other words, they have the right, they're not using it. And what have they done with it? No one ever asked men to prove what they were going to do with the right to vote when they got the right to vote. So once again, it's a, it's a complete imbalance of, of, of um, what, you're, what you're asking people to do. Mm -hmm. But now we vote, women vote in much larger proportion than men. And we vote differently for men. Although all women, interestingly, um, women tend to vote uh, more in favor of government, both conservative and progressive women. Uh, there is a women, be, probably because of the wage gap and all of that, the earnings gap, uh, women seem to feel more of a need for government than men do. Uh, but nonetheless, that old, that old anti-suffrage crowd, that anti-suffrage um, 
uh, uh, outlook on life. I want to be protected by my men. I want to be up on my pedestal has clearly moved on uh, to some conservative uh, women today, which is, which is too bad. Good. Anybody else want to unmute and ask a question? Because um, this has been absolutely terrific, Lynn. It's so good to hear all this stuff, especially from you because you've been working on it for ages and ages and ages. It's great. Thank you. Well, I hope if some of you are so inclined, you'll take a listen to the podcast because it, it really is fun and it'll give you a lot more of, of what I've been doing. And um, uh, it, it's an important thing to know. Uh, it's an important history to know about and to understand in all of its sometimes very messy uh, implications. Uh, it's not a straight line. Um, it's not a clear through line. There were ups, there were downs. Um, there is a straight line, Stacey Abrams tells us, from Susan B. Anthony's conviction to voter suppression today, there are some straight lines, but there's other stuff that, you know, we're not perfect, uh, our heroes were not perfect, uh, but they got the job done and we have a lot more, we have further to go. We do. The podcast, by the way, is called She Votes! Exclamation <laughs> point. And you can find it where you dig up your podcasts. You can. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I have a few things I need to say to Lynn, probably without the rest of you here. So if you'd like to leave, that would be lovely. <laughs> Thank I, you. I, I, we have another question. Okay. Yeah, I, well, I asked in the chat because I missed the author and title of the Sojourner Truth biography that you said you recommend. Nell, Nell. What by you asked for me. Her first name is Nell, N-E-L-L, -L, Painter, P-A-I-N-T-E-R. Thank you. Right. You're welcome. And I missed because I had a, a very active puppy doing her Zoomy time. Um, what was, what's the name of your podcast, Lynn? Name of the podcast is She Votes. If you bear with me for one second, I'll give you the, show you the logo. I think I could find it, but thank you. Uh, oh, but let me, my, my, our producers will be so excited if I do this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Okay. <laughs> you vote. Oh, right. And you can, and you can get it wherever you, as they say, wherever you um, watch your podcast. It's, it's out there. There are eight episodes. Each one is approximately 30 minutes. Ellen Goodman and I are, Ellen Goodman from the Boston Globe, um, our co-hosts, and we had a great time doing it. And some of the guests are really fun, and you get to hear Christine Baranski being Susan B. Anthony, and there's a cameo appearance by Alan Alda. So, Perfect. please. I actually can't <laughs> wait. I, I really want to listen to it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was terrific. Wonderful. Thank you. Wonderful. Margaret, email me. Okay. okay. Lynn, um, I just need to have a, a short word with you. We need to have your snail mail address. Great. Um, you know what? I'll email it to you, Lisa. That's right. That's a perfect thing. Okie doke. Well, I, I'm sorry. I didn't see Carol Schneider here somewhere, but I think she did sign up to come. Oh, can I? Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot to. I, I, yeah, she said she was coming. I have one thing to add. Those of you still here. So I told you that the, um, uh, uh, the 19th Amendment needed 36 states, and the 36th state was Tennessee. Guess what state waited to be number 37? Connecticut. <laughs> Your very progressive, very bold state was number 37. That's right. We're always, Sorry about very, that. always very careful here at Connecticut. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. You're a great audience. Okay, great. Thanks, Lynn.